gross. Like right in the fucking. Light, yeah. This has to go in it. <laughs> you think? It's Jeez. tuna. Yeah, I know. It might be over crazy. Name tag. Yo, I, I, I figured you were gonna see that and be like, "What's uh, what's it doing here?" Actually, the Aldi. <laughs> Why is that still there? Yeah, yeah don't think real. about it too hard. You know, <laughs> that's You're that's right. always my motto with everything. It's like, don't think about it too hard. We can do that for what I'm about to do because I'm about to do the first deep. So I'll, I'll walk in, sit down, and then finish up my first deep. Hell yeah. Ready? <laughs> I should walk in from the door. Nah, it's nah, fine. Just there. All right. You're good. Cause... So here's the story of Terry. So I was looking through all these tabs, and uh, there was finally a cream of the crop. Uh, model, a uh, Tascam 464 that was up for auction. I immediately emailed this guy. I'm like, hey, do you still have the Tascam 464? No response. I wake up the next morning, 12 o'clock rolls around noon, and he still has not responded. I sent him another email. I'm like, in bold letters, Tascam 464 uh, still available. I'm like, hey, I have cash in hand, like bold letters, right? Half an hour later, I get a text back. Hey, is this Casimir? I still have the Tascam 464. When would you like to pick it up? And I said, are you free at three? And he said, yes. <laughs> and so I left. He brings me around to the back to the garage. Um, you know, just like every red flag is going off for a Craigslist deal. And uh, there it is in this pillowcase bag, this seemingly untouched 464. And I brought all this stuff in my backpack to test it. I was, it was a little obnoxious, but I was really ready to just figure it out. I'm plugging XLR cables into it. I'm testing my headphones. I got tapes in there. I'm testing. I see the fast forward rewind works. And then play and record doesn't and he's like oh well you know do you even want it because like i could understand if you don't even want a broken piece of gear i think it's going to take a lot of work but you know i'd still like it but i can't do a hundred dollars and he's like no of course not he was like well how about 20. and i, I kind of like play cool for a second i'm like you know it's going to take a lot of tlc and elbow grease but yeah i could do that and he goes how about this how about this twenty dollars I'll throw in an electric bass and headphones. And at this point, I'm like, you have an electric bass? And he goes, yeah, let me grab it. So he goes inside and he comes out with studio reference monitor headphones, right? And he comes out with a P-style electric bass. And he brings these out, he goes, $20. And at this point, it's unreasonable. There's no way that this could be reasonable. Like, I know that, this, like, 
this isn't right. I'm robbing this man blind. And so I'm like, are you sure? $20. He's like, yeah. He was like, I was kind of hoping that a kid like you would come around and pick this up. And I was like, thank you, like a lot. And he helped me bring everything out to my car and stuff it all in the car. And, and I was like, you know, hey, uh, you have my number. You know, please like send me send me the link to to like all your uh, your music that you're still making now. And he was like, sure, only if you send me the same with you and all your friends. And I was like, bet I could do that. Mythic is the red, which is like super, super rare. Those are hard to get. Um, let me do this real quick. Ready? I, I like remember recognizing you guys, and you were like some of the only people that I knew at school who just. And we had we had like at least three classes together that semester, so like we were just always hanging out, trying to go to your like dorm or something, either your dorm or Fletcher's dorm. I just you know like kill, kill the time in between classes and just like hang. Those dorms were legendary, to be honest. Yeah, brother, like I, so, it, uh, <laughs> it, that, those are the best memories. Freshman year, we just kind of chilled mostly with each other. I mean, I had other friends, but you guys were like my homies, you know. And then you guys moved into your house and with uh, Josh and Drew and, you know, it, you, you guys were doing all the, starting to make the shirts and everything and it was forming and uh, I don't know, I just was kind of already in the whole scene with you guys, so it was natural. Just like. That was the group, you know what I mean? Like chilling and playing board games and just like drawing. And uh, then like sophomore year hit and you had a fucking space and it was like perfect. Well, I just remember one day we were like hanging out and you just like wanted to bleach all of your clothes with just like liquid bleach because it looks cool. <laughs> uh, so you just like brought a shit to your clothes outside, just like poured bleach on them. And then I feel like you and Joe were like, we should make clothes. <laughs> and then you asked me to like help embroider and I was doing like some embroidery like for like the images you were making. Just like as a group, like you guys had been talking a lot about like, well, like maybe we should start a clothing brand and like trying to figure out like the different ways in which we can all incorporate our skills into that. And then that was when you guys got really into the screen printing thing and you guys spent a lot of time trying to like, I guess like troubleshoot that, like just like figure out how it worked. Like there's so many different steps and it's such like a whole process. What I liked, I thought was really cool, the like tunas on the back of all the shirts. Like I just hand embroidered a little like tuna logo on the back of the t-shirts. I was thinking about it the last time I was over here yesterday, right? And I was like, this is such a punk house, dude. You got like fucking screens in the bathroom just stacked, stacked up. And then you have all this flash behind me and fucking you have a basement turned into a studio. Like seeing you guys work on stop motion, fucking uh, figuring out the house show bullshit, shirts, all that shit. Just like the deep, embracing the DIY spirit and just like embracing life, you know what I mean? And like taking that next step, even if it's like maybe a totally fucking mistake. And you guys have always like come out on top, you know what I mean? So I was like, oh, I'll take a deep breath.
to the week was the first show that we really went out of our way to like put on. You could just feel the vibe that something special was happening that night. It was the first like real show at their house that we had had. Then when the time came to do a concert at your place, we had already had the Terry introduction. So <clears throat> that was really something behind us that was then influencing everything that we were doing after that. So everybody knew that we needed to record Tune Wheel on four tracks. So we wake up early, right? We move all our furniture around so our living room is like kind of more open. And then you have this weird period of time for a few hours where there's nothing to really do except just like pace. I will say I did risk my life for tuna weed. I literally hung half of my fucking body out of that upstairs window from the bathroom when we were trying to hang that spider web in the backyard. I was like 50% certain that no one was going to come and then 50% certain that it was going to be like crazy. People might be like in and out, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we got the wristbands, you know? So that they can like, we know if they are the... And we started the night at like 5, I think, was when doors started because we had to get it done early because we had six bands playing and we needed to be done by 11 at the latest because of our neighbors. We got it all set up and on that day, Chris's album came out, the Jason's Phantasm album came out, so I remember I brought my speaker and I put it behind the couch and I was just playing that album on repeat as people were coming into the door. Chris did not play one single fucking song off that album. They went down there and they jammed for 20 minutes straight and that was it. And it was one of the coolest fucking jams I've ever seen. showing up and then you finished your like 12 minute set it was like the shortest set and then it hits this point where you walk upstairs and you look around and you're like holy shit there's like 50 60 people here we're really doing this I should probably go back I should go back to doing this it was sick I used to wear a ski mask for friend shows at the beginning um because like that whole out anti-hero thing like I was just wearing a ski mask um and it's hard, it's so hard to see out of those. So I had like put it on and it was dark as fuck in the basement. And we had started playing Antihero. And then I just like, I think I'll remember this probably for the rest of my life. I like took the mask off and the basement was just fucking packed. Like to all the way to the back. Like I was shocked. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, exactly. You have a good dad. 
Yeah, then America Loves Me was next, and they fucking killed it. We played our first show as friend with them, and like I was blown away. I was like, oh my god! Like I had never like listened to hyper pop, and like that was like the best first experience I could have gotten to that. Yeah, one, two, five, two, three, go! Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go! Hey, 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 hey. Uh, Philadelphia house shows in particular, yeah, um, it's a very communal thing. Um, especially like being in college, it was like I always felt like I didn't have like a, you know, you know, I feel like a lot, there's always times in people's lives when they feel like they don't have a lot of friends or whatever, and it's like, I think, you know, there are good and bad experiences just being in public in general, but for the most part, I found a lot of solace in like the like D DIY pop scene that I find myself in now. Um, and I think that how, like, the venues, you just, you typically just go and there's not, like, community more than it is, like, real venues, you know, they're selling tickets, they want you to buy drinks. Um, you know, house shows, it's like, they're, li you're literally putting your space at risk because drunk teenagers come and I've seen people punch walls, you know, I've, I've seen people, like, fuck up bathrooms and it's like, but the people who do that, you know, they're not doing it because they're like, I'm gonna make a bunch of money, you know, they're doing it because they love music and they love, like, the scene in Philadelphia and they want to see it thrive. More time to sweet easy. Be that next time. Just clap if you care. Beautiful. It's a Wendy Williams quote. <laughs> is it? Oh, it is a Wendy yeah. Williams quote. There's so many good Wendy Williams moments. Clap if you think she should suffer. Oh my god. <laughs> Playing with people. Always be like, what's up, man? You know? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. cool. Like, we're both, like, right. are you packed? Yeah. I don't know. I feel like sharing the stage with other bands right. it's like we're both doing something personal right yeah. now and we could like right. probably just make each other laugh a little bit right. i don't know i think because we started playing together so young at fletcher too like we had an idea of each other's like values and stuff and it's important to me that i'm playing with people who share the same values as me especially because like a lot of my songs are personal and i want everyone playing them to be on the same page um, it doesn't seem forced or forced, but also, you know, it's really not hard to just be nice to people. Yeah. yeah. It's also... We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Keep me Literally. hanging on. <laughs> Alright, it's time to play our pops tuna set, right into the Cabo Cabo set. So we get on stairs, and sit behind the drums. I'm like, oh right, I live here. Um, and uh, I start getting a little nervous, I'm like, oh. Ooh. What happens if I die during this set? You know? <laughs> It'd be really embarrassing if everybody came over to my house and then I died and I couldn't finish the set. This is legitimately what was running through my mind. I was like, I fucking hope I don't die. Right? As soon as you play like the first verse, right? The first little bit of the song, you're like, oh shit, I do know how to play the drums, right? I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna die sitting here. I had a great time. I was screaming my head off during that show. It was amazing. Like, Jill. It clicked in his head that day. He put on. <laughs> he, changed, he changed. He put on this uh, like long. Uh, what's it called? It's like a trench neo coat. trench coat. Um, and then cowboy cowboy played, and that was like you know it was just kind of like the perfect close to it all because that's it all started with cowboy cowboy. None of us were really making music with these projects before that, and so it was a really nice performance to like kind of take the whole year that we just had with COVID happening and all of this like you know weird stuff and cancellations from like previous shows and stuff to kind of like have all of our new projects play and the final one that brought us all together like Tuna Collective was Cowboy Cowboy. Cowboy Cowboy would grow up to be Tuna Collective. Everybody in there you know Tuna or uh, the Cowboy Cowboy is kind of the Olivia Tremor control of early uh, Tuna Collective. It, it had all of the 
core founding members save a few people. And then Cowboy Cowboy stops plays, and we kill it. And then there's this moment of like, boys, we fucking did it. We pulled it off. Nothing went wrong. I didn't die. <laughs> Nobody else died. We all sat around afterwards, just, just like in disbelief that that was the night that we had had. You know, like watching videos, playing magic and shit like that, and it got, you know, what, might, maybe like one hour afterwards, and I was like, yo, I got the tapes. We are like, oh, bet. Like, let's listen to the tapes. And we just listened to all the tapes at like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and just were mind blown. Like, they sounded so good. It sounded amazing. So I was just like, I'm just gonna make, like every day, I'm just gonna make songs. And then I was like hanging out at Matt and Aubrey's all the time because they were still living in Virginia at the time, which is crazy. Um, and I was like, I have all these songs. Do you guys wanna play them with me? Like, we could practice in your basement every day until the show and then make it happen. Yeah, um, I mean, tuna, like, definitely brought us up here, you know, like, uh, I mean, it, it was definitely like, I mean, the friend stuff, like, got us up here playing shows, which was obviously big, but, um, I don't think, like, I don't think that would have happened if, like, we hadn't, like, come and seen, like, Cowboy Cowboy, and, like, been so into, like, Pops Tuna, obviously. We started planning for the holiday special because we were like, well, we did Halloween, we should do like a holiday show. But we got Ethan Kerr because we were friends with some of the people in the band and then they knew Earth Dad. They also were so sick to have at the show. And then it was just, it was Friend, Earth Dad, Ethan Kerr, and Pops. Pops too, yeah. And uh, yeah, you can't really hear much besides that, <laughs> so you kind of jump around and you can literally step on my guitar and make the same noise. You know, with not playing for, I don't even know how long. Um, two years? We, yeah, two years. We really just had to get back into like the emotions of playing live again and uh, getting back into the scene because, you know, drastically it changed just with like, you know, the people coming out. And yeah. I think it definitely, the scene definitely shifted. I feel like I knew every band and every venue beforehand and now after the pandemic or during the pandemic, there's, I don't know shit. I'm like, I'm out of the loop. Um, it was, yeah, it was a little difficult getting back into it. I think the scenes are actually more similar than people think. Uh, music great everywhere. New York has a cool scene. New York's different, though, because I feel like the shows are more like... It's less of a house DIY situation than I feel like it's more like a small venue. Yeah, yeah I think so, that's yeah. the hardest part with, like, you know, musicians like us, including you guys, like, trying to find, like, our spot in the scene.
Being Earthdad was really awesome. I'd never heard of them until uh, Tuna got them on their bill. So it was cool seeing them perform. Um, and then Chris bought their tape uh, that they were selling. And that same night, we listened to it with the little task cam and we're fucking around with it. It was really cool. <laughs> I hit up Teo, or Teo hit me up on SoundCloud one day and was like, you guys want to go on a 10 day tour? And we're like, hell yeah. So our first experience with them was touring. Um, they were really fun to be with. And then ever since we've been like pretty close friends. Uh, they come to Philly sometimes, we go to New York and I was like, hey, if you want to play a show in Philly, we got a cool space to play with and cool guys to play with. So it worked out well. <clears throat> what I remember from their set is like everything sounded like a real song. Like I remember hearing it and it was like, you know, our sound system is not like grade A, but like, wow, like everything that, that they played was like, oh shit, this is like a studio recording. I, I mean, those were, those are probably some of the tightest recordings that I have on the page. I'm frightened by my poetry And it's never seemed to start From the bottom to the top my signature was new to me A shadow climbed back ready and one was in like Wyoming or something. Dude, you should do that one. We're playing. Okay, hour and a half. I was, I was like between going to uh, the Tuna Psych Fest or going to the Chai Show, and I was really couldn't make up my mind. And then I got a call from either Joe or Fletcher saying that a band, a band like dropped off the bill and they needed like someone to play, and asked if I'd be down to play with Bluey. 
So like, I just like that made. I mean, that just like made the decision for me. Like, like I didn't have to think about it. I just I was like, yeah, like, yeah, we'll, we'll play. Before we start, Kyle is gonna order pizza. Can I please just get a plain pizza? That's it. Can you, can you, all right, cool. Uh, can, can you do like 45 minutes? <laughs> yeah, can you scream? I, I, I can just show up a little later. That's fine. All right, I, I, I'll do it for 30 minutes. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> And that's the pizza! That's the pizza! Getting a video of Kyle and his pizza. <laughs> it's it's such a diverse community. It's uh it's really cool just seeing all these different genres and like collaborations that are going on within the scene. And and especially it's eclectic compared to you could go to another scene you like and you might you might basically get the same sound kind of you might get the same direction. Yeah, this is a mixed bag of uh, just when you come to Philly. Everyone's kind of throwing Especially it. Especially today, everyone's really It's chopping. really evolving into something Philly cool. Sound. Shred Flintstone, which I did not know Shred Flintstone, but Chris and Joe spoke very highly of Shred Flintstone, so I was excited to hear them. Shred was loud as fuck. I'm pretty sure my bones are rattling. <laughs> they started playing, and I was like, wow, like my organs are moving. Like, <laughs> like that bass cap was fucking insane. shirts that were made for the show like that nice. uh, i've never seen that before and they were like sick shirts when do shows in like basements have shirts in philly <laughs> uh, 
in the, in the Tuna Collective, you know? Like it's, it really it's, felt like a little festival. Like yeah, Disney you walk in and there's already set up to the right, and you're just like, all right. And the people do that. I remember. You walk in and you're like, all right, absolutely, this is the place to be. Yeah. Rico is fucking awesome. I mean, they, they're like, I haven't seen anything like them in, in the Philly area and like the, the DIY scene. I mean, it's like, it's one thing to be a DIY jam band. It's another thing to be a, to be a DIY jam band and be good. The way that like Philly is like just is set up and like how like there are these old ass places that like haven't been touched and like, I don't know, like I feel like there's there's scenes in other cities, but just like Philly in particular, it's like, like the just the availability of basements, I guess, yeah, yeah. is like so overwhelming that it's like. <laughs> and people tell us they. Move and people here. are like, "Why the fuck not? Will we do this?" Yeah. Like, Chris and I have been struggling so much with how to end this documentary. Yeah, this is probably like the <laughs> 20th take we've done of this video. These last four years, we really, all of us, were just getting inspired by each other, you know? Like, we were all making art mm -hmm. and all pushing each other to make better art. And now, if you look at where we started and where we ended up, it's like a huge difference. And it's really cool to see how all of our friends got so inspired by each other that they had to make art, you know, had to had to start singing, had to start screaming, you know, had to start playing bass, had to start playing drums. I think that's the most important thing, like, if you want to make art, like, just start doing it, just get start your friends doing to do it. it, just start making art, like... Make a scene in your, make a scene in your community. community. Like. It's, it's really just about getting like-minded people together and making some noise. Over my place. 